Hello, I'm Lane Hartzell with the Korea IT Times, and I'm here this morning with my series on Technics and Civilization, and this time on Techni and Episteme, or Philosophy of Technology, and with Ryan Mabaluk from the University of Davao in the south of um, Philippines. Good morning. How are you? Uh, good morning, Lane. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be in your uh, program. Happy to uh, discuss uh, to you these uh, important uh, matters on technology. We, uh, I've read a lot of your work, uh, especially, uh, well, from the Integral Science um, book uh, about a year ago, and we've talked uh, at length in the past. Um, you have a couple articles that were in technique uh, related to philosophy of technology, such as Feinberg and Marcuse. Uh, I want to ask you some questions and then let you kind of, uh, you know, these are, I'm going to ask you some general questions and then see where you want to go with these as far as how you explain it and uh, relate it to what's going on right now. The, um, so, so basically, let's start with what's the current state of philosophy of technology and, and modern techniques? I think uh, we are into this, uh, what we call a techno rational socio political uh, order. Uh, a lot of things uh, that are happening in the world are influenced by uh, the consumerist uh, culture that somehow define uh, for people their behavior. Uh, big tech, um, the overall uh, makeup of this is, of course, the instrumental uh, relationship uh, that people have uh, towards each other. It's something that is influenced by the complexities that uh, have been brought about by this uh, capital and uh, profit-driven uh, activities, uh, globalization, uh, the advent of uh, the internet, and many of these things that uh, have actually uh, determined how people think, uh, deal with each other, uh, behave, and as such, it has affected human relationships influence uh, outcomes of elections and many other things uh, that somehow um, deny uh, human beings a more authentic uh, sense of uh, themselves. In, um, the publications in, say, Techni or um, other uh, technical journals, I see, it, if you look at, say, continental philosophy, which is what you're talking about in your paper, um, uh, there, there is a concern about, uh, you know, technological determinism, instrumentalism, how it affects the human being, uh, nature. I see some of that in your work. Uh, and when we, when we think about that uh, in, a, in a highly developing or quickly developing area like Asia, which is very big. So let's say China, uh, Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, ma major developing areas. What, what are you seeing uh, in these areas? I mean, um, certainly environmental problems, certainly instrumentation, instrumentalization and so forth. Well, we can uh, talk about the liberating role of uh, technology, how uh, okay. it's supposed to enhance uh, the lives of people. Um, the role of technology is uh, not just uh, to make life uh, convenient, but rather there is a more integ integrated factor as regard uh, to the function of technology. And that is the seamless uh, relationship that human beings must have with the world. Technology mediates that uh, function. Yet uh, what is happening, however, is that uh, we have remained uh, subservient to the power of uh, machines. To, we have become too dependent on our gadgets and somehow this has uh, diminished our ability to really um, define the kind of life that we want to live. So that instead of us uh, using these gadgets, it's actually these uh, instrumentalities that are taking advantage of us, controlling us. Uh, what I'm trying to say is consider a a young kid, for instance, who wants a new phone uh, from a substantive end as to the meaning of technology, it should mean that any new phone is meant to communicate to parents. Uh, yet, because of the influence of social media and you factor in this uh, consumer culture, uh, 
uh, the child will choose the latest uh, model, not because of uh, the relationship uh, that one must develop in trying to connect with people, but because it is uh, what is in it's the trend and uh, that somehow is what we mean when we say that we are controlled by gadgets by machines and uh, this is the kind of uh, mentality that people have right now and the uh, finberg would call this technological rationality well in the past of course uh, you want to cook you need fire and uh, you need something in order to do that you have a farm you need a, a beast of burden and right now you have tractors to do that job uh, for you understandably that's a good thing because it helps you like uh, ease the burden on this animal and uh, at the same time it also enhances uh, the experience yet um, you cannot uh, look at technology in such a way right now because in capital driven societies uh, a tractor will be very expensive and so the farmer sees it differently. And in so far as the farmer cannot afford this uh, farm implement and this farm uh, machine, the farmer goes back uh, to a sense of uh, being alienated from. Okay? So the gifts of uh, modern societies. That's why uh, it can be said from the point of view of critical theory, the technology alienates us. And in, in those two experiences, uh, you have an individual who is alienated from her parents. And uh, secondly, here is a farmer who is also alienated from uh, development and progress. And, and these are things that we should uh, try to address if uh, technology is supposed to serve uh, mankind. That, that makes me think of uh, when you move from farming up to, say, the factory production and uh, some of the factories not not just in Asia, but in the world, uh, people are um, driven mad. Uh, you talk about in your paper on Feinberg about, um, you know, it, uh, this kind of technology turns people into stupid autom autom autonomous, you know, uh, the aut yeah, autonomous. How do you say that? Autonomous? Automatons. I must say a term, uh, it was a term coined by uh, uh, Michel Foucault. He calls them automatons. And uh, what that means is uh, docile yeah. bodies. Yeah, yeah, automatons, docile bodies. Uh, I should know that word. Of, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I should know that word. I think I know it from reading, but not from speaking. Yeah. The um, it, uh, This is a reference I don't know if Foucault mm -hmm. did it uh, intentionally, but it's to Adam Smith, who said that yeah. the, without government intervention into the market, that it will turn people into the stupidest beings ever seen. Um, this is a function, I think, of economics and technology. And when I, when I, what I want to get to this is that not that people are stupid but it, it, it the, the system turns people into stupid so one is do we have a determinism the other part is the effect on the human being can be so severe uh, that people are uh, committing suicide at work which is something that's not usually done right until you know you get the factory system uh, what can you make a comment on just uh, this kind of uh, determinism and I think this goes back to the uh, modern period where we have a mechanical view of the world. And uh, with that mechanical view of the world, uh, of course, uh, you have a, a, a question, a big question as regard to the authority of uh, human reason. Now, uh, with the advent of factories, uh, modern times uh, is uh, defined as something like a uh, the human being uh, being a cog in the machine, uh, he becomes a tool. And uh, that is a kind of reductionism as regard to the authority and supremacy of human reason. Um, in our age, uh, the problem is that uh, people actually fear uh, like automation and artificial intelligence because there will come a time when uh, robots will take over factories. Initially, mm -hmm. the understanding is that uh, these robots uh, should help human beings uh, 
reduce uh, potential exposure to risky and uh, dangerous and hazardous uh, work inside factories. But right now, as you mentioned, the, the whole economics of it uh, will suggest that uh, sooner or later, these robots will be taking over from human beings uh, a lot of these uh, factory jobs, at least in the developed world. In the developing uh, societies like uh, in the Philippines and uh, the rest, that is uh, not yet a threat uh, because uh, we have to factor the human side of uh, production and labor is still uh, cheap uh, here and uh, we don't have uh, the kind of market for uh, this uh, intelligent uh, technologies. We don't have markets for smart homes, uh, for instance. And so we might not uh, be problematizing that in the short term, but in the long term, when you talk about... Uh, uh, elite societies and uh, high-end uh, economies, uh, that uh, certainly will be a problem uh, because uh, these intelligent machines will be replacing human beings. Now, uh, what are my reflections as regard to this? Well, um, we cannot stop these things from happening. Um, it's part of uh, progress and uh, it's part of uh, the evolution of the human mind. I think uh, the best thing to do is to be able to adapt uh, to this uh, changing uh, paradigms. Say, for example, when we talk about the home, the fact of the matter is that uh, we see the home as uh, our soul, so that uh, somehow we define human beings on the basis of uh, the beauty or how expensive a house is. Yet uh, the idea, however, is that if we go back into the more substantive and intrinsic meaning of uh, techne. Okay? Uh, the human character should be uh, put into that house so that it is uh, human relations that should define how beautiful a house it is. And so in that uh, respect, uh, it is also about what society is. Uh, you know, children will have to get out from their rooms and uh, go out and see the world. But right now, what uh, children actually see are the four corners, corners of uh, their room. They go out, they see a tree, but they do not see nature. They right. want to learn, but uh, as they read books, they don't see real human beings in these books. And so um, integrating with nature means that I get out of my uh, uh, egocentric uh, stance as regard to how I, I see and view reality and uh, in that respect it is uh, important okay, that for a child to really understand what it means to live that the same uh, human being must realize that his relationship with the world is not only instrumental so what i'm trying to say is that when one goes to a factory one should not feel that he's just a tool if i go to my office i should not feel that i am being imposed upon by a kind of academic culture Rather, I'm there because I am free to exercise my uh, freedom. And so um, that's what uh, we mean by this liberating role of technology. It should be able to enhance human life rather than uh, denigrate life into an instrumentalist uh, definition of what it means uh, to live. You talk about uh, children. There's a number of ways we can go here, but I want to actually I want to mention children because you talk about this in your paper that they are um, and I forget who you reference, but they are and we are are living in a kind of um, not a kind of, but we're living in a delusion uh, created that separates us from. Uh, the nature from human warmth and relationship, you call it warm body, I think you called it. This is dangerous, right? That's a leading question, but is this dangerous? Yes, it is. Um, in, in that paper, I uh, started my reflection by uh, observing people uh, at a cafe. So what's the point mm -hmm. of uh, meeting people? It's the face-to-face -face encounter, the uh, personalistic uh, and uh, intimate uh, type of uh, relationship that you desire to develop uh, with people. But when I observed that when two people at, uh, are at a cafe, instead of talking uh, with each other, they are manipulating their gadgets. Okay? They think and they tend to think that uh, they are using their gadgets. 
But the uh, fact of the matter is, it's actually their gadgets that are using them. Okay? So it's the us. human being. <laughs> yeah, it's the human being that has become a tool, tool of uh, capitalist uh, enterprise of uh, the corporate uh, uh, interest that uh, is found in the kind of, as you mentioned, delusional or the virtual reality that uh, you are putting yourself into. Um, that's what uh, Meta is trying to do in the Metaverse. Uh, you are being uprooted from the reality. And when it comes yes. to kids, uh, it's like you are imposing certain values on children instead of children uh, realizing for themselves the meaning of their freedom. So that uh, instead of educating them, allowing them to unfold on the basis of their capacities, the questioning minds, you simply... Uh, like uh, control them by uh, making them follow rules. And uh, precisely, that's the, the, the importance of uh, emancipation. So, and uh, by this emancipatory approach to education, uh, critical thinking is actually lost. Uh, there's no logic there. You, you meet someone and yet you are still uh, doing things uh, on your gadget. Uh, there's a meeting and some people are like in front of their laptops in, instead of say, trying to, uh, you know, interact and uh, share stories or uh, put uh, questions uh, that would somehow make you recognize that you are with a human being. Yet uh, what is happening is uh, our daily activities or schedule, these are technologically mediated. And so we become dependent on the internet, on connectivity when uh, we talk about the Philippines. There's a joke uh, that uh, if your kid uh, is locked in uh, her room for three days, that kid uh, will survive without food. But that kid wouldn't survive without uh, Wi-Fi. <laughs> that's, that's the idea <laughs> here because they're more interested with the, their uh, virtual uh, connections rather than the you know, interpersonal aspect of uh, human uh, relationships. Uh, Let me ask you... Um... Let, okay, maybe some practical advice for people that might be listening. Uh, you know, say, for example, I get up in the morning and there's this gadget, this, this phone that's really an extension of our, it really is an extension of our memory, um, communication and all of that, which is fine. I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's an augmentation, right? It's not a virtual reality. It's an augmentation of reality. All right, but uh, the phone... Um, we can we can uh, project onto it. It's calling to us, right? Like they they tie Odysseus to the mast because the sirens are calling to to him. There there's a certain aspect of our uh, psyche, um, our our, in, our our psychological makeup that uh, it, it, we have desire uh, with the psychological makeup, and there's something about checking messages, uh, looking on. Um, uh, social media, and there's a kind of draw there to that that feels like a compulsion. Uh, is that, uh, I mean, I think the compulsion is, is something that needs to be dealt with. What do you say to people that feel compelled, like the people you're talking about in the cafe, for example? What do you say to people that could be helpful about this compulsion, uh, this com compulsive aspect of technology? Yeah, um, in his uh, post-phenomenological uh, approach, uh, Don Aide uh, explains uh, what uh, we mean by this uh, technology as an extension of the human uh, body. The idea here, there's, uh, as Peter uh, Paul Burbick said, there's an ethics of things. And uh, the, the point is, um, what do things... Uh, do to us, okay? It's not what we do to fix. Okay? And so, fact of the matter is that because you have a cell phone, okay, so you'd uh, be tempted, okay, to open it and uh, see what uh, you would want to see. And uh, Marcuse calls it uh, a delayed type of gratification. So uh, there's something exciting. Uh, there's a lingering thought that uh, you want to know and uh, by opening this gadget then uh, you are taken over okay? and that's what technological determinism is uh, 
technology controlling us or gadgets controlling us so that our mindset, this technological rationality deprives us of uh, autonomous attitude. I cannot just say that I'll uh, keep this phone away from me and will not open it. There is always that temptation because technology has actually taken over. Now, imagine yourself at a place where there's no internet. There is nothing that you can do. You cannot really check uh, things online. And so you're forced to commune with nature, talk to people and uh, do like climb a tree or you know, hike or do something else. But uh, because the house has Wi-Fi, it is like uh, the oxygen to, to, to us in order for us uh, to breathe. Okay? And so we are actually being subsumed into this, uh, into this world. And as, I, as, an, as an advice, okay, I, I, I suppose, uh, as I mentioned uh, at the outset, we cannot do away with this. We just have to remain authentic uh, to ourselves. Okay? So we have to uh, be our usual self. It doesn't make you less of a uh, friend, for instance, if you text someone instead of visiting this person at a hospital. Um, in the past, uh, parents uh, wouldn't know where their children are because there's no way of checking before the invention of uh, the mobile phone. And right now, because there is uh, the internet and the social uh, media platforms, you get to know what your kids are doing. And you cannot, of course, pry into what they're doing because that would, uh, I suppose, be antagonistic and uh, would, uh, in a huge way, uh, tell them that uh, we are interfering with their personal lives. Okay? It's still important to allow people to have that uh, freedom to do what they want. And yet, um, the fact of the matter is that uh, there's really no way of getting rid of these things right now because it's part of uh, the, the development of uh, modern society. Yet, uh, while we cannot control that, there's always something that we can control. Our, our sense of uh, fortitude, our authentic character, and these are things that you can yourself decide. And so when people say nasty things online, they do so because of their motives, because of their interests. Well, you cannot uh, control what happens online, but you can always control yourself in terms of your motives, in terms of what you want to do. And uh, that uh, precisely is what Heidegger is saying when he says that we are in frame so that thinking becomes calculative, so that all thinking becomes very rationalistic, and uh, people now forget, even those uh, who are administrators in schools, they are now focused on the platform, they're focused on the methodologies, on the tools. And right now they have information and communications technology taking over so that instead of focusing on developing human character, instead of uh, focusing on how we like, you know, develop uh, good values on children, they are now focused on how one platform can be useful. So that's all, uh, that, that th th these things are part of the instrumentalization, as Finberg would say, of, uh, of society. And uh, the way society is designed is based on what he calls this primary instrumentalization. Okay? Now, mm -hmm. how do we get rid of that? Uh, that's what he calls secondary instrumentalization. What is this? Well, let me... You know, it's, let it's me about, uh... yeah. Let me jump in. Okay, so so let's say, for example, for primary and instrumentalization, yeah. I'm I'm a scientist and I make this uh, eye pin, yeah. and okay, I have a specific idea in mind to make this eye pin. Okay, now I give this eye pin to you. What happens with secondary instrumentalization? Well, primary instrumentalization is about the idea of the designer. Secondary instrumentalization is about everyday life. Okay? So, and so the, the important thing there is uh, what does the individual intend to do uh, with that? Okay? So I, I remember buying an iPad and uh, the, 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 the iMac of, of my daughter. Okay? I, I told her that uh, the same computer can do the same things. But uh, right. she insisted that no. Okay? So the, 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 the iMac and uh, the, the iPad, they are uh, like not only stylish um, in, in terms of user-friendly interaction, they are of 
like in terms of quality, way, way better compared to the competition. Yeah. Of course, the idea here is uh, iPhones and uh, iPads and you know Apple products are prohibitively expensive. Yet you also mm -hmm. realize that it is what your daughter wants. Okay, it makes her happy. And and so as an ordinary consumer, how do you get to decide on these things? Okay, and these are the factors that you consider when we talk about secondary instrumentalization. Okay, so um, what does it do to everyday life? Okay, and uh, here there are experiences that are way way uh, like. Uh, that, that, that the designer that does not uh, really capture. Is, uh, what are these experiences? For instance, uh, you just realize that uh, your daughter is very creative and uh, the, the book covers, uh, for example, she did it uh, using her iPad. Okay, so it's, it's, it's something that you as an ordinary consumer, as a father, for instance, is buying this expensive gadget for your daughter, doesn't know. Uh, but it comes with the experience, but it's not something that is part of the packaging, not even part of the marketing. They market it as a stylish, uh, state-of-the-art uh, gadget. And yet this aspect of creativity is not there. This aspect of, uh, say, you seeing uh, your daughter doing something beautiful and uh, really useful, it's part of everyday life uh, that's not there in the packaging. And this is, this, these are things that we do not usually uh, see. How, say, these uh, gadgets, for instance, boost uh, one's uh, sense of self-identity and confidence. It's part of how uh, we, we develop uh, uh, as human beings and our children developing this uh, sort of personalities. And uh, this, I think, are, are, are part of how we uh, you know, pursue the good life. And, and, and secondary instrumentalization, according to Finberg, is that uh, liberating uh, aspect uh, that technology introduces to us, which will depend, uh, of course, in the experience of the user, uh, users themselves, not uh, on the company that created it. It depends on how you see these things, but they are useful and uh, you will have to integrate it to everyday life experiences even the experience of fatherhood to see the real value of these things that you cannot actually put inside this uh, beautiful packaging when they sell these uh, expensive products. And that's a great commentary because the um, people might not realize the, the concepts of instrumentalization, but they do realize that they're taking that technology and doing all kinds of other things yeah. with it and so forth. Um, Let's move on to people-centered technology. Now, what, what does this concept mean? I mean, I'll tell you what it means to me is that uh, the technology is developed for, you know, in philosophy, human emancipation. Uh, uh, so if it's about human emancipation, okay, we got that. Uh, but in the more everyday world, what would people-centered technology look like rather than, a, a, you know, a techniques of uh, ownership uh, by large corporations or something? Well, uh, there are two important things to consider, and uh, one of which is uh, the hegemonic uh, relationship that uh, relationship that people have uh, towards uh, each other, and by this uh, we mean. Uh, society is actually a division of uh, the haves and the have-nots. And uh, we define people sometimes and uh, sadly on the basis of uh, their socioeconomic status. And when people uh, hold on to these uh, machines, for instance, these tools, uh, these uh, gadgets, they serve as a status symbol. And, uh, and what happens here is that it therefore reinforces uh, the not only the digital divide, but the social and moral divide in uh, society. And so in that respect, um, it alienates uh, rather than uh, gathers or unites people together. So if uh, you have, say, advanced uh, classrooms, for instance, in a society like the Philippines, uh, people will notice that this uh, advanced or high-tech uh, classrooms with all the sophisticated uh, technology in there, these are only available to the affluent uh, sector of uh, Philippine society. And when you go to, and there are a lot of jokes that you can find, a lot of memes 
some children who uh, are studying or are schooled in the rural areas, they have to climb trees to get a sig signal and uh, their classrooms are dilapidated. Well, of course, that's a bit of an exaggeration. But fact of the matter is that um, there's that uh, obvious and at the same time latent uh, social and uh, moral uh, divide. Now, the second uh, aspect as uh, regard uh, to this uh, contention really is this whole idea of uh, adaptability. Okay. Um, what does it mean to be able to adapt to technology? Well, uh, Finberg would uh, argue that uh, context is uh, very important. Okay, so, so for example, if we talk about uh, cities, uh, the problem with uh, the traffic situation in cities is that people mistake it as a problem of having uh, too many cars. Okay? The problem really, the issue is mobility. So that if you become more efficient, uh, you have to look at people, not look at cars. But, but when they try to solve these problems, what do they do? They be, build more roads. And so it uh, somehow addresses the problem of having too many cars, but it does not address the problem of having too many people. And so they are not solving the issue of mobility really. What they're doing is they're expanding roads. And so it's just admitting that it's okay to have too many cars in the city. It results to a lot of, uh, of course, uh, problems, pollution, uh, loss of productivity, uh, among others. But when people begin to look at what we call a people-centered type of technology, like the subway that they're building right now in Manila, we're looking at mobility, how this uh, thing addresses a problem. It's a problem of mobility. How do you put this individual from one place uh, to another? Creating more roads doesn't solve that. Okay? What you need to do is to create an efficient system that will allow the mobility of people to go uh, smoothly. And so when I speak of this uh, people-centered technology, we have to begin addressing uh, problems on the basis of, say, a whole uh, an, an integrated system wherein we see things holistic, in a holistic way. Um, one way of looking at it is, uh, say, for instance, um, you have uh, some disruption so at home because uh, your kid is uh, a bit uh, hyper in terms of uh, what uh, that child does uh, at home. Now, how do you address that? You, you cannot address such by you know, giving this child reminders and, and telling this child that you do this and you do that. that that's not the way to address it. You that try to make the home safe for this child okay? so that right. this child is able to adapt in an integrated way. And so the danger, therefore, is when we are too focused on form and we forget uh, the value of function. Okay? And that's precisely... The, the way we should look at technology. So it's, it's not the form. But what is the function of technology? It's supposed to serve human beings and uh, make human beings uh, feel at ease. And in that sense, it, it goes back to the, the whole context of what it means to have a good life. Okay? And so one irony is that a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of money has been spent building artificial uh, oceans, artificial gardens, when in fact nature provides it for free to us. So, so that uh, in the cities you try to recreate artificial oceans and artificial uh, recreation um, venues, when in fact you can simply go far and away from the city and enjoy what, uh, what nature can, uh, can give us. And so, so that, that's, that's the, the mistake that we human beings actually do because we tend to forget that being people-centered is also about being nature-centered because when there is this uh, symbiosis between people and nature, it's not about whose interest is uh, on top, but rather what serves uh, people best is also the same thing as what serves uh, nature best. It's, 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 it's wrong to think that... Uh, you know, when you build this, uh, this edifice, then it is uh, prioritizing human interest. If it destroys a part of nature, for instance, if you build something on a protected area or you mine some place that is a protected area 
and uh, you say that uh, there's a lot to earn in terms of revenue, that's not really serving the interests of humankind. That's destroying uh, humankind. Uh, in so far as one man must be one with nature, and, and this is this this whole context of biocentrism is is all about. Technology should be like that. Uh, technology shouldn't mm -hmm. be at the expense of, of man, but rather technology should be able to serve man by by mm -hmm. using technology the best way we can, so that we do not uh, destroy nature and uh, disrupt uh, human relationships, as I mentioned uh, at the outset. Yeah. <clears throat> Let me challenge this. Uh, so uh, apparently there's a, a beach in, I think, Dubai or somewhere that the, somewhere it's really hot, that they have an air conditioned sand. So let me push back and say, well, I want my air conditioned sand because, you know, it's hot at the beach. How do you respond? <laughs> well, uh, it's a different uh, story because, uh, of course, uh, perhaps uh, the, the heat in, uh, in, the, in the Middle East is, is, is different when compared to some place like in the Philippines. But uh, here, even if that's the case, they are building uh, some uh, artificial uh, nature-oriented uh, uh, recreational uh, facilities. And uh, instead of going to the beach, which should be easy for them, um, Dubai has a lot of money. They have a lot of uh, oil money and they can spend uh, all they want that money for whatever uh, it's worth. But uh, when you have uh, societies that are defeated in terms of uh, economic resource, then I suppose that money should be better spent on uh, improving the lives of the poor and protecting nature rather than uh, creating these facilities, which somehow only provides us with a, 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 you know, a bird's eye view of reality, but not uh, exactly what reality is all about. Right. <clears throat> Going back at... I try to relate this philosophy to, you know, everyday uh, life for people. Uh, there's, there was one video, kind of like a sci-fi-ish video, but actually real now, where there's a family and they say, okay, we're going to put all our phones in this little plastic lockbox and it has a timer on it. So it's going to be for one hour. So every day when we have dinner, we all have to put our our phones in this lockbox and turn it on for an hour and they go and sit down to eat, but no one knows what to say. Uh, and what's interesting is I think that the technology is changing our brains, right? So right. you sit down and you don't have anything to say because your, your craving is for <laughs> yeah. that phone. It's, well, by with, within about, I don't know, uh, 15 minutes, they all are on, you know, about to kill each other to break open this uh, plastic box. Have you seen this video? No, I haven't seen it, but uh, I, I, I understand what it tries uh, uh, to tell us. Uh, well, the, the idea is we cannot really impose uh, ways of living uh, on people uh, because that would uh, defeat the very purpose of our freedom. So, so that uh, if we kind of uh, dictate uh, to our children what they must do with their cell phones. Well, in the first place, don't buy cell phones for them if uh, you don't give, give them the freedom uh, to do what they want to do with it. And so ultimately, it, it goes back to the, the, the idea of autonomy. Yeah, the problem there is uh, also, you know, um, the user friendliness of certain apps, the user friendliness of certain cell phones uh, make these uh, gadgets uh, do the manipulation so easily on people. I, I, I remember my, my father when he didn't know how to use smartphones uh, uh, for the first time, he only called okay? and uh, he doesn't text, he doesn't do social media. But uh, as soon as uh, he was taught uh, by my, my uh, sibling how to use his smartphone and uh, so he had this Facebook gadget. So I could just imagine because my, my my father is, is different in terms of personality and imagine if uh, you have uh, some kind of uh, that personality and uh, you will encounter problems uh, uh, in the future. And so the, 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 the problem really is sometimes with, with these gadgets, this user friendliness uh, has an impact in the manner we relate to people.